Welcome back. Jimmy and Izzy and the whole Kitty Club and Wolfie are here to listen to the, uh, let's see, it's part 17 of Avril Crump and Her Amazing Clones, published by Orchard Books, an imprint of Scholastic, who have generously given us permission to read this online. Um, if you remember when we left off, um, uh, Gideon Blute was just about to, like, use his scalpel on Eddie. And um, Avril and Augustus and Boney and um, Lionel and um, Dr. Weatherby have all found each other. And now they're looking for Eddie. And they're close by. Remember, they passed them in their van. Chapter 20 is called Augustus's Ears. I can hear something. Sitting in the front seat of the car, Augustus cocked his ears and held up a paw for complete silence. Lionel had stopped the car, persuaded by Bonaparte that Mr. Dog's wondrous powers of hearing would locate Eddie and save the day, if not the entire world. Now Augustus put his head on one side, closed his eyes solemnly, and began to rock back and forth. Augustus, what on earth? An opened eye and a glare were all it took to silence Avril. It must be some necessary ritual for Mr. Dog to employ his prodigious sensory talents, Bonaparte whispered. Nobody breathed. In the distance, Augustus could faintly hear Eddie's voice. It's true. The police will find out everything. It's Eddie. I can hear Eddie. Exhausted and triumphant, Augustus slumped backward, a paw across his bow, brow. Oh, Mr. Dog, Bonaparte seized a paw and kissed it. I knew thou wouldst not fail. Naturally, but even the greatest of us occasionally suffer the pangs of completely unnecessary self-doubt. Augustus, where is she? It came from that direction, he pointed. A, toward a large clump of gnarled and ancient oak trees before leaping out the window. Doors slammed and feet thudded as Avril, Bonaparte, Lionel, and Dr. Weatherby scrambled to follow him. What was she saying? Avril called. Some of her usual nonsense, Augustus leading the way, was in his element. It's a good thing I've got these superpowers, you know. Where would you be without me? In a hole, that's where. Stuck in a great, big, black, he suddenly disappeared from sight. Mr. Dog, Bonaparte dashed forward. What hast befallen thee? Hast thou been dragged into the jaws of hell by some hideous woodland ghoul? Hast thou been lured into a cruelly planted booby trap whence there can be no escape? Boney, he's fallen into a small hole. Lionel peered down into a pit. Augustus looked back up at him. Help, he spat. Are you all right down there? Avril approached, approached cautiously. Just fabulous. Anyone care to join me? Lionel, you and Boney had better get Augustus out. Raymond and I will go and find Edna. Oh, will we? said Dr. Weatherby. Like I said, Raymond, it's a long way out of these woods without a car. Dr. Weatherby glowered at her, but he didn't speak again. My brave little Avril, Lionel seized her hand. Avril blushed. She now bore a startling, though not unappealing resemblance to a lightly boiled beet. Bonaparte clasped his hands and gazed at the couple. A moment of your time. An irritable paw shot out of the hole. Lionel and Bonaparte began to pull at it as Avril and Dr. Weatherby hurried onward through the oak grove. Moving with remarkable speed, Avril thrust aside a couple of shrubs. The voices ahead of them were getting louder. It's hard enough with mutant brats offering opinions left and right and center. I will not tolerate your input as well. Suddenly, Avril could see Eddie. She was in the middle of the clearing ahead, tied up and hovered over by a scalpel-wielding Gideon. Edna! Quick as lightning. Dr. Weatherby seized Avril's sleeve and pulled her behind a large tree trunk. Stop, you stupid woman, he whispered. We can't just go barging in there. 
Nonsense. There's two of us and only... Avril had just seen the clone of herself. It was stomping around irritably and muttering. Unlike the rejects in the cabinet at Gargoyle Manor, it possessed the correct number of limbs, but that did nothing to comfort Avril. Setting eyes on a walking, talking, living, carbon copy of herself was an experience she never wanted to repeat. Not a pretty sight, said Dr. Weatherby. Raymond, this is no time for your nasty wisecracks, Avril whispered, but Dr. Weatherby's normally smug mouth was set in a tight line of distress. Avril started again. Okay, Raymond, here's the plan. We're even, two of us and two of them. We'll just go over and demand they give us Edna. Look, genius, Dr. Weatherby said, we're not even. If we barge in over there, shouting and carrying on, he'll just kill her. He's got nothing to lose. Anyway, he's armed with a scalpel, for heaven's sakes. What have we got? I have absolutely no desire to become an endangered species. Let's take a look in that briefcase of yours. Maybe there's a spare test tube we can break and use as a weapon. No! Dr. Weatherby pulled his briefcase toward him. This is private property. Oh, that's fine then. We'll look for something else. Humming casually, Avril glanced around the forest floor. Then catching Dr. Weatherby off guard, she leapt forward and snatched the briefcase out of his hands before he could grab it back. She had smashed it on a nearby rock. It fell open to reveal its contents to the pale moonlight. A charred lump of wood, the shattered and useless remnants of a few test tubes, and several singed plastic bags filled with powder. It was the ruined remains of Uncle Edgar's chemistry set. Avril gazed at the contents of the briefcase. What are you doing with this? All right, all right, Dr. Weatherby held up his hands. I confiscated it from lab one while you were talking to the clones. I thought it would impress the management if I actually had some evidence of your irresponsibility. Avril decided it was no time to argue. Well, it's not a bad thing to have now. Maybe we can use one of these broken tubes. Just mix a few of your precious powders together and cause another explosion, why don't you? Avril stared at him. You're a genius. She began to search through the broken box. If I mix this and maybe this, oh, her head sank in disappointment. We need sugar. I can't make these explode without sugar. Anxiety welling up inside her, she reached for the sharpest looking of the broken tubes and rummaged in her pockets to find a tissue to pick it up with. I don't know, we'll just have to wave this at him and shout a lot and... She stopped. Her fingers had touched something soft and squishy inside her pocket. It felt familiar, very familiar. She recognized that sensation immediately. It was a donut the plump and perfect donut she had stuffed into her pocket back in Gideon's library. She beamed up at Dr. Weatherby. We have explosives, she said, and we have sugar. Let's rock and roll. Okay, chapter 21 is called The Blast from the Past. Please, Eddie was sobbing now. Please stop, just let me go. I won't tell anyone, I promise. Images of her short life began to flash in front of her eyes. Augustus, sitting loftily on his bucket in the broom closet. Bonaparte singing his bizarre song to a captive audience. Avril creeping across the forest floor, bearing a large donut. She blinked. This was not a memory. Avril really was creeping across the forest floor forest floor bearing a large donut. Gideon Blute, Avril boomed. You just hold that scalpel right there. Gideon turned around, his face contorted with rage. Avril, he snapped. Well, obviously. Not you, I'm talking to the other one. Avril too, get her. I wouldn't if I were you, Avril said as the clone lumbered toward her. This donut is packed with explosives. Any sudden movement and it'll blow. Avril, too, stopped in her tracks. She looked back at Gideon. Well? It's very simple, Gideon. Avril took a wobbling step forward, then steadied herself as Dr. Weatherby gave a warning yelp. Nobody needs to die. Just put down that scalpel 
Scalpel untie Edna and let her go. Gideon smiled. He looked very handsome in the icy moonlight. I think you have made a terrible mistake. No mistake, Avril said. I will do this if I have to, Gideon. There are enough explosives in here to send us all on a one-way ticket to kingdom come. As soon as she had spoken, she felt that she had made a terrible mistake. She won't drop it. Avril, too, was eyeing the donut. It looked awfully tasty. She licked her lips. If it blows up and kills us all, it'll kill the little girl as well. Gideon twirled his scalpel again, tapping his silver signet ring as he did so. Let's quit playing Quidditch here, he said. I've got some very important samples to take. Let her go, Avril repeated. You don't want me to detonate this, Gideon. Really, you don't. Gideon looked at Avril with utter contempt. Go back to the hole you crawled out of, Dr. Crump, and leave me to my work. He clutched the scalpel tighter. He stared back down at Eddie, then raised it high above her head. No! Avril lunged forward in panic. The donut tumbled from her hands. Get down, Dr. Weatherby screamed. Everybody hit the ground at precisely the same moment as the donut. There was no explosion. Ow! Dr. Weatherby was the first to break the silence. I think I broke my ankle. I knew they were bluffing. Avril, too, lumbered to her feet and waddled forward. She could not contain herself any longer. In one swift movement, she had stuffed the donut into her mouth and swallowed it whole. Then she burped. Tasted a little funny. She burped again, much louder this time. It sounded like a small car backfiring. This is all very entertaining. Gideon was on his feet again. Do your job, he told Avril too. He pointed at Avril. Kill her. The clone was not listening. She looked like she was in a lot of pain and put a hand to her stomach. Must have been bad, she said. A deep, low grumbling was emanating from her middle. Then it became a rumble. It was getting louder. Her eyes locked onto Avril's. They spoke in unison. It's going to blow. Gideon smiled at the two horror-struck Avril's. If you will excuse me, he said, I have somewhere else to be. No, Avril too was lurching around as the donut ricocheted in her stomach. You can't just leave me, help me. Gideon looked puzzled. Help you, he said. I should never have created you in the first place. You've been nothing but trouble. I will stick to pure breeds in the future. The clone lurched past him and toppled to the ground in agony, legs and arms flailing. She landed directly on top of Eddie. Avril shrieked, get away from her. Hey, a shout came from the right side of the clearing. Where's Eddie? Gideon swiveled around. It was Lionel, Augustus and Bonaparte advancing in as threatening manner as they knew how. Augustus was growling ferociously. Lionel was brandishing a wooden stick. Bonaparte was shrieking. What have you done with her? Lionel roared, purple faced. He reached for his old police identification badge, then decided it would not be all that much use in these circumstances. Instead, he raised his stick high in the air. Gideon moved fast. He seized Avril around the neck. His scalpel glinted. Come one step closer, he informed Lionel, and I will use this. Lionel hesitated. His stick wobbled. I think Dr. Crump will accompany me to the van, Gideon said pleasantly. He began to drag her backwards, his sharp eyes watching Lionel, Bonaparte, and Augustus. I am sure that her current position means that none of you will try anything foolish. Edna's over there, Avril jerked her head backward. Underneath my clone, you have to save her, she said. There's a bomb. The rumbling was almost deafening by now. Lady Avril, Bonaparte wailed. The three of them were frozen with indecision, and then a movement across the moonlit clearing drew all their eyes toward it. Don't just stand there, Avril gasped at the three. Save Edna. Ah, heroics in the face of certain death, Gideon said. He was nearly at the van. Well, he said, it will be a shame to leave all this behind. It's been a blast. Avril could not understand why Lionel, Bonaparte, and Augustus were simply staring. Then she heard a noise behind her. Abandon me, would you? It was Avril too. Clutching her roaring stomach, her eyes were ablaze. 
Gideon pivoted around to face her, almost losing his balance in surprise. If I go, Avril too looked at her hateful creator, I'm taking you with me. Gideon blinked. For the first time, he looked unsure of himself. His hold on Avril slackened slightly. Augustus seized the moment, ears flat against his head, legs coiled, he launched himself across the clearing, barking like a dog possessed, and bit Gideon firmly on the behind. With a scream, Gideon let go of Avril and swiped at Augustus. Avril stumbled out of his grip and began to run toward Eddie, just as Avril too grabbed Gideon in a lethal bear hug. Didn't you say it had been a blast, she grinned. The whites of Gideon's eyes glowed in the moonlight. There was a howl of fury, then an explosion. Then a brief moment of perfect silence. Mr. Dog! Bonaparte, pink from head to toe with a light coating of jelly, was the first to arrive at the cloud of smoke that billowed from the place where Gideon, Avril II, and Augustus had been standing. He began clawing his way frantically through it. Avril, bright red from head to toe with thick clothing, coating of jelly, staggered to her feet. Augustus, her heart froze, where is he? He is gone, Bonaparte's howls filled the ashy air. He was blown away. Untie me, Eddie called to Lionel. She held up her jelly covered hands. Avril dropped back down to her knees and crawled into the thickest part of the smoke. She could just make out the shell of the van and a singed and tattered lab coat, but Augustus was nowhere to be seen. Any sign of Gideon? Lionel asked as she backed out of the smoke. I can't see anything but his lab coat, Avril said. Perhaps we'd better hunt around though, just to be certain. He's a goner for sure, Lionel said, but that explosion will have been heard for miles around. The police could be here any minute. We just need to find Augustus and get the clones out of here. We cannot find him, Mr. Lionel. Bonaparte was clinging to a tree, his tears streaking through the jelly on his face. Mr. Dog hath sacrificed himself to save us all. He is dead, dead. Eddie cupped her hands around her mouth and shouted as loudly as she could. Augustus, Gus, where are you? But there was no answer. Bonaparte began to sob. He shouldn't have done this, Avril choked. He shouldn't have saved me. Lionel put a helpless and sticky hand on Bonaparte's shoulder. I don't know what to say. Edna, can you see him? Avril ran to join the little girl who was hacking her way through thick shrubbery. Is he in the, there? No. Eddie wiped her hand across her eyes and gave up attacking the shrubs. He's not anywhere. That stupid dog, Eddie sniffed. What on earth did he have to go and kill himself for and do it in such an attention-seeking way? Honestly, Gus. Eddie sank into a cold, miserable, sticky heap. How one small donut had produced so much jelly she could not understand. You know how to make an exit, don't you? How many times do I have to tell you? The voice came from high above. My name is not Gus. Tis Mr. Dog! Bonaparte fell to his knees. He speaks from heaven! No, I speak from this tree. Can somebody please get me down from here? Four pairs of eyes gazed upward. There, perched perilously on a branch, a little singed around the ears, sat Augustus. So do I get a reward? He waved his tail. Or perhaps some sort of victory march is in order? There was a very small blob of jelly on the end of his nose. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's see. Okay, we're going to stop there for tonight and we will finish tomorrow. We'll see you then. Bye.